Good morning. This is January 24th. We are in the middle of a monumental mess with respect to Russia and Ukraine. So bear in mind when this was recorded because events may rapidly change and maybe negate some of the things I'm saying. But let me attempt to say some general things which might have some value irrespective of what happens in the next few days and weeks. Let me also say that what is going on right now is super serious and uh, could have long-term implications, not just in Europe and Ukraine and Russia, but for the United States. So let me say some general things. First, um, Ukraine. Ukraine is a country of about 41 million people. And I believe it's the largest landmass country other than Russia in that part of the world. And while Putin suggests that the Ukraine has always been part of Russia and so forth and so on, there have been periods of this, but actually uh, the Ukraine is a very ancient country. It goes back centuries. Uh, there is a separate Ukrainian language, for example, even though while the Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, everybody was asked to learn Russian. Uh, and there are, especially in the east of Ukraine, native Russian speakers. Um, the other thing to be said is to look at that map and see to what extent uh, there is a point from the perspective of the Russians that really NATO member countries is sort of all over Europe and very close to the Soviet, uh, ex-Soviet uh, Union, which then as it split up got incorporated and now is very close to Russia, right? So if you, the map is kind of instructive to see that there may be Russian paranoia about NATO uh, expansion. And I don't just mean paranoia and will on the part of Putin's part, but also uh, in terms of the Russians themselves. Uh, that is to say the population, even anti-Putin people, uh, see that Russia has you know, come out on the very short end of the Cold War and has become, shrunk to be a rather sm much smaller country uh, in terms of territory, while Europe and its institutions of the European Union and NATO and so forth have marched, have marched forward. The other thing I want to say before I talk more about politics is that um, for the Russian psyche, um, having in a sense lost the Cold War, but being perceived as you know, sort of a loser non-entity country uh, is very hard to swallow because the Russians in many ways, of course, were major forces in so-called Western civilization. I mean, think of literature, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, uh, think of music, um, you know, Shostakovich, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 20th century composers, think of artists, think of dance, ballet dancers, Baryshnikov, etc. I mean, I could go on and on to say what we perceive to be part of an important aspect of our Western culture was in fact produced by Russians. And they're very proud of that. And they have a right to be proud of that. And to be sort of seen as some, not, you know, a minor country that's not part of the West and that is, uh, uh, you know, been put in its corner after the end of the Cold War is, I think, psychologically and culturally quite painful. I say all of this without going into long and song and dance about all the important artists and writers and so forth who are Russians uh, that we, you know, consider a normal part of our culture. Um, because on the one hand, large chunks of the Russian population are now anti-Putin, uh, and Putin, you know, wants to be dictator for life. 
Uh, on the other hand, there is a certain amount of support for some of the things that Putin says about encroachment into you know, proximate Russian sphere, as well as diminishing the importance of Russia. So while certainly you know, enlightened, smart Russians and anti-Putin people are opposed to what is currently going on and the militarization of all of this, uh, there is some level of support. Uh, it's hard to gauge. And I would say, just putting the cart before the horse here, um, Putin will be able to do all kinds of things uh, with respect to the Ukraine and Europe and so forth. But um, if too many Russians are killed in the process, I think he will lose a lot of national support in Russia. As I say, Russians can kind of see taking a stand on Ukraine or Eastern Ukraine uh, who are anti-Putin people, but Russians in general, having had so much loss of life in the 20th century, are, um, I think, are really leery about having Russian soldiers die. I mean, one or two maybe, but if this gets to be a nasty battle. Uh, the other thing is that part of what people don't understand about the Russian psyche even comes goes back as far as World War II. I mean, we talked extensively and rightfully about 6 million Jews having died in World War II, having been killed by genocide. Uh, we rarely talk about 13 million other Europeans having died during the Second World War, but we even more rarely talk about the 20 million Russians that lost their lives. So in the Russian psyche, um, you know, they feel maligned, underappreciated, not respected in some ways um, as Russians, not as Soviet Union citizens, but as Russians. And I think we don't bear to take that in mind uh, sufficiently. Now, at the end of the Cold War, you know, Gorbachev and Reagan and all of that, uh, Russia uh, gave up a lot. And at the time, um, NATO was uh, much smaller, didn't have 30 members. And it didn't seem so alarming. And the European Union didn't seem too successful. And America seemed to be very strong. And all of these variables have now changed. Um, from the perspective of almost everybody in the world, we are a much weakened country, we the United States. Uh, we are uh, not just weakened sort of militarily, which we're not, but we're weakened in terms of respect and influence. And that somebody like Putin will is happy to take advantage of. And as he sees the decline of the United States in world affairs, we don't tend to think about it, right? We're strong, powerful, biggest economy and all the rest of it. Uh, and so we focus on China as being our adversary and the rest of the world, meaning both Europe and Russia, uh, sees that these are changing situations in Europe and Russia. And in this case, Putin is trying to take advantage of that. So one of the things that, is, that Putin seems to want to accomplish is on the one hand to undermine uh, Ukraine, even if he doesn't run it wholeheartedly or completely. Uh, he also wants to undermine the European Union uh, and uh, create schisms in the European Union, and that is happening as we speak. Uh, and, you know, he wants to uh, diminish uh, the military and political influence of the United States, in addition to ourselves, we ourselves shooting ourselves, um, you know, in, in the foot. Um, I think that, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Thomas Friedman, you know, wrote a pretty good column about this maybe a week ago. Uh, and he added that the other thing that Trump wants to accomplish is to bring Trump of that uh, Putin once accomplishes 
bring Trump back, right? So he has very clear missions here. Whether he can accomplish them and at what price for him and for Russia, question, and we'll see it unravel in the in the days and weeks and weeks to come. So let me speak of uh, NATO for a minute. Uh, NATO is strong militarily in part because of the United States and NATO is spreading its wings militarily all over its membership. You can pro uh, probably saw on the news, arms are being brought to Scandinavia and every other place. So there is a huge rearmament, if you will, or arms extension on the European continent, which is quite dangerous. Uh, because accidents happen and you start some shooting and it can escalate. So this is, this is quite dangerous. Uh, the other thing that is happening is that the European Union is fractured, of course. And the European Union used to present a real strength with respect to Russia and other parts of the world. How is it fracturing? Well, it's fracturing, A, because of Brexit. That is, say, the UK, which, among other things, was the strongest military country in, and still is in Europe. And uh, the other thing, and other interests. That is, say, countries may have EU interests, but they also have national interests. And one of the things to consider, which gives Putin a sense of strength here and leverage, is that Europe is very dependent on the energy resources coming from Russia. So that the business of saying to Russia, you know, we're going to cut you off or we're going to do this or the other thing to you, Russia can easily say, okay, we'll cut Europe off from our energy sources. Now, of course, Russia needs the income from those energy sources, but temporarily, at least, it can create havoc. It, we are in winter time, right? And the Germans, for example, are, I think, 40% dependent on energy coming from Russia. And that's because before you even talk about whether that pipeline should be opened or not opened. Countries have uneven uh, in Europe, are unevenly dependent on Russian energy sources. For example, France is less dependent than Germany because France has nuclear capacity. And one of the interesting things in Europe right now, which is very well understood by Putin, is that um, it's been a very, it's a cold winter, right? We're in the middle of winter. And many countries very obediently began to go green. That is to say, to get out of the business of using coal and oil and so forth. And many countries successfully swapped over to a green economy. Well, the green economy is one, costly, and B, does not satisfy the national energy uh, needs of most of the European countries, especially in the winter, right? So that the energy requirements of Europe are to some extent leverage for for uh, for Putin in 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 many ways. Um, again, he is dependent on the income. Russia is dependent on the income, but the Russians are suffering in any event, and Putin wouldn't think twice about at least temporarily making them making them suffer making them suffer more. The other thing is because of the energy shortages that have resulted in worldwide, uh, we even we have noticed huge increases in energy prices. So that for Europeans, the cost of heating their homes and driving their cars has gone up, I think 200%, something like that, an extraordinary amount. Um, and that of course means that uh, there is national, there are national politics in Europe that are quite in disarray. And you might have noticed over the last few months, year, maybe two years, that most European countries are now multiple party coalition governments because no single party is able to rule anymore. And that, of course, weakens the capacity of many European countries to act quickly and effectively because they have to mediate between their various partners that are running the, running the country. And then in addition, if that isn't enough, you have France and Macron 
who says, yes, well, we're part of NATO and European Union and all of that, but actually we can't count on the US anymore and they're providing adequate security. So Europe itself should have independent security capability. That and says to himself, see, they're in disarray in Europe. Uh, they're nationally somewhat weakened. They're economically weakened because of energy. And the, even the politics are in some state of disarray. And then to add one more nail to this coffin of Western disarray is the fact that any number of countries headed by uh, Great Britain, I might say, England, uh, is deciding, okay, yes, we're members of NATO, we're loyal members of NATO, but we also want to deal independently with Putin and Russia. So um, the UK, for example, has sent independent emissaries on this whole business to talk to Putin. And so Putin is encouraging European countries to talk individually and deal in a bilateral fashion with him. The uh, the net result of which is that the coherency of Europe is radically reduced potentially in Putin's eyes and the ability of the United States to have leverage over all its European allies has also eroded a further kind of weakness. And then the US it, in itself is weakened for a variety of reasons uh, a weak administration because of COVID and other things, and a sense of political disarray and of undermining of the democracy that Trump produced. We almost had a coup and so forth. So Putin is able to say to countries, this is not your democratic role model either. So what I've done is given you a litany of things that makes Putin feel, well, this is a good fairly good time to strike. What I want to achieve might be achievable. That is to say, to undermine Ukraine by weakening it, either militarily or politically or through cyber attacks, and maybe get the Ukrainian government back in place uh, that is more friendly and more easy for us to manipulate, right? Um, and we will further you know, needle the European institutions to undermine them. And we will uh, further our goals by pointing out to European countries that they better deal with us in a bilateral fashion, and they certainly can't count on the U US anymore. So let me turn a page and say something totally different, Lee. Uh, the US has made the argument that um, you know, Russia has nothing to fear from NATO and its encroachment into NATO and its increasing Western uh, link of the Ukraine with the West. Even if the Ukraine doesn't join NATO right away, uh, much of modern Western Ukraine is Western oriented nowadays, right? The younger population and so forth, they're not learning Russian, they're learning English. The Ukraine would like to align itself with Europe. It would love to be, you know, more intimately linked, but it could probably tread water and wait. But anyway, Ukraine is being slowly sucked into Europe from the from the Putin's perspective. And Putin says, uh, you know, this is our part of the world. U.S. kind of get out of it. And he has an interesting, he has an interesting historical take on that and says, well, you know, the United States has the Monroe Doctrine, right? It very seriously objects to anyone like Russia, for example, Soviet Union, uh, putting its foot into uh, the affairs in, um, in the Western hemisphere. Well, this is part of our hemisphere. We have, just as the United States is eager to, uh, uh, you know, sanctify the Monroe Doctrine, look at how ex exercise they got when we put missiles in, uh, in Cuba, right? We almost had a war over that. They got very upset about that. Well, why shouldn't we get upset by the countries that are proximate to us or that we feel in the case of Ukraine, actually belong to us, even if it doesn't, but in any event, uh, why are they reacting this way when they in their own hemisphere are reacting um, 
uh, the way they are. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, Putin has uh, said that, you know, if the U.S. escalates this thing, uh, he might, in fact, put some more missiles and nukes and so forth back in Cuba and Venezuela. And then we might have another war on our hands, right? Another crisis of different sorts. So he's not stupid about any of this. And he shows, he tries to show the American hypocrisy. He tries to show Americans unreliability in some ways. He tries to show that Europeans have interests of their own, which are not joint interests with the United States. He tries to show uh, the world that the United States has been weakened and he will do everything its power through cyber warfare and uh, other things uh, to create a situation that enhances, enhances his position. Will he be able to do so? I have no idea. Uh, will this become a serious shooting war? I have no idea. It may happen in the next few years. Could this escalate into almost a world war? Yes, theoretically it could. Mistakes are made, things can happen. Uh, is that what Putin wants? No, I don't think he wants that. I think he wants recognition that uh, Ukraine ought to be Russia directed. Uh, and he would like to have a government there, which is more friendly with Russia. He would probably like the Eastern provinces, which are mostly sort of Russian speaking, Russian aligned anyway, to become part of Russia again. Um, and he would like to accomplish a weakening of the United States uh, in Europe. He would like to enhance schisms in Europe, as in pointing out that Germany has different interests than France with respect to energy and so forth. Um, he would like to make the small Baltic countries nervous. And we somehow seem to think by quickly sending arms to them that strengthens the situation. And that's what we did in the last few days, right? Um, and these are, you know, pipsqueak little countries. Uh, there is no way that they can really protect themselves. Uh, there is great danger, it seems to me, in thinking that this problem can be resolved through arms and threatening more arms and through military means. Uh, and, uh, you know, is there a creative fix? Well, oddly, uh, James Baker, a secretary, important secretary of state, right, under Reagan, et cetera, um, once wrote an op-ed page piece where he said that the smartest thing to have done or that should be done is to actually ask Russia to join NATO, to make NATO, in a sense, a European, Russian, whatnot, uh, you know, protection uh, area and, you know, an attack on one is an attack on all and to bring them aboard rather than having separate them. I thought so at the time that he was right. And I think, I still think it's right. Can that be done now? Maybe yes, maybe no, that would be difficult. But it's um, some creative thinking about the Russian mind and Putin's mind uh, which is very difficult to read, would be very helpful on, on all of these events. Now, I said before that to, Putin is also skating on thin right, ice. Um, he is not very popular in Russia anymore. He wants to stay in power. The country is an autocracy, a kleptocracy. He is a dictator. He's 70 years old. He probably wants to stay in power for life. And he uh, can ill afford uh, to create a situation in Russia where his either supporters or if not supporters, you know, people who are not uh, terribly, uh, you know, well seasoned, there's something going on outside, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, that his supporters who are weak supporters, who go along with him, but who may be tired of their situation uh, to uh, undermine 
his capacity to keep ruling. So he has to be careful. As I said, he has to be careful that not too many Russians get killed. He has to be careful that this does not go out of control. And he has to figure out some way to achieve his ends with respect to the Ukraine, undermining European co uh, co uh, unity, um, to undermine America's role and so forth. So he is not having an easy time of this either. And when we all say no one knows exactly what he's going to do, I think that that's right. But it's also may very well be that he himself at this moment is not sure what he can accomplish. Obviously, a negotiated settlement uh, would make a lot of sense, a settlement in which um, he might get the Eastern provinces, but certainly a confining NATO's activities, uh, make, getting him to agree that, I don't know, Ukraine won't join NATO for 25 years or something of that sort. Um, that all is on the table and at which point a package could be put together before the shooting starts uh, is not clear. There's also an urgency to get something sorted out in the next few months because uh, the, these Russian tanks and so forth can only roll when there's solid ground and ice. Once you get spring and melting, these military operations can't really work very well anymore. So either something is going to happen very quickly if it's military, I mean, within the month, next month or so, uh, or um, some negotiation will be worked out that all the sides can agree on. And I think uh, at the end of the day, it's not just the things that Putin is demanding, but also what the West, what NATO, what the US is willing to give. And it might have to be a lot more uh, than is currently on the table, I would say. It is a monumental mess, but at the end of the day, uh, Russian is internally weak. Their economy is really quite awful. Uh, people are not doing well in Russia. Uh, the, you know, the new dawn after the Soviet Union, the economy getting whole and better and so forth has not really happened, partly because of the kleptocracy. The money is flowing out to whatever half dozen or a dozen people who have mansions all over the world, etc. Um, and the U.S. keeps talking about the way to gain leverage is through sanctions. And I think others have said, you've probably heard them say, sanctions have never really worked. Uh, that is say you can make things painful, uh, but not necessarily painful enough if somebody is really stubborn and has, has a mission. Sanctions are difficult to implement. And the US has a, you know, a whole shopping list of sanctions but the problem with that is that many of the European countries will not want to go along with those for self-interest. Their economies are more linked with Russia, not just energy, but also trade and so forth. And so the Europeans increasingly are saying individually and collectively, hey, guys, we have our own interests here, too. And if you you can't, we will not go along with an American, uh, you know, long list of sanctions if those sanctions are counter to our interests. So the idea that the U.S. has uh, the capacity to have joint interests with all of Europe uh, through NATO, through the European Union and so forth has frayed badly. And so the U.S. weakness, I think, needs to be taken into account here and account. And somehow we don't seem to take that into account because we imagine that at the end of the day, we're so powerful militarily uh, that we have leverage. But unless you're really going to believe that we're going to have a world war and that nuclear uh, weapons are going to be used, the political weakness of the United States, uh, by political, I just don't mean 
President Biden, I mean, uh, the fraying of our democracy, uh, the danger that Trump and Trump return and Trump people and the fact that whatever 71% of our fellow citizens say the election was stolen and so forth, makes us hardly look like a role model in the world for democracy, but also weakens us in terms of leverage and influence. So one of the bottom lines I want to say here is I have no idea what's going to happen. But if we imagine that the U.S. Have, has massive influence, uh, we are uh, weakened in our influence capacity. And Putin smells this. And he is going to get an ounce of blood. And part of what we should all be concerned of is while this game is going on, military uh, accidents can happen, and this could easily go out of control. So what we need, all need to pray for, is, in a sense, is that the militarization of this dispute does not go out of control. Anyway, not happy news. And as I said, many of the things that uh, one can say today may not be true two or three days from now. So forgive me if they seem irrelevant when you listen to it, but I hope some of it will stay relevant. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.